Hi, everybody, and welcome to the October Lymphedema Patient Roundtable. We are so pumped you're with us tonight. It is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, so we are in our pinky hues tonight. Um, my name is Alexa Ercolano. I'm the Marketing and Communications Associate here at LymphaPress, as well as a primary lymphedema patient myself. And we are pumped, as I said, to have you here with us. And while you're all logging on, Say hello in the chat, and I'm going to introduce our panel of ladies tonight. So we've got Angela Jones, lipo lymphedema patient and health coach, Catherine Rosenberg, pediatric cancer survivor living with secondary lymphedema, and she's also a math teacher, as I like to say. So any math questions, you know the drill, goes to Catherine. And we've also got Karen Ashforth, certified lymphedema therapist and fibrosis extraordinaire, looking very Regency style in her beautiful top tonight. So. Before we get started, quick housekeeping. Remember to pop your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom so we don't miss them because chat sometimes goes pretty fast. And we'll do our best to address them a little further into the hour. And at the end of the evening, Karen is going to close us out with a lovely exercise as she is wont to do. And we love that. So we're excited for that. And of course, gentle reminder that we are not your doctor, but your pal, but we are your pals. So we can't give you specific treatment advice, but we'll talk from our own experiences and defer to Karen on the panel for any general medical discussion. She knows the facts. All right, so I am going to stop talking, um, but I want to segue real quick into the topic of Breast Cancer Awareness Month. It's an important month, uh, shine a light on breast cancer awareness and as a lot of us know, studies show approximately one in five women who receive breast cancer treatment do develop lymphedema and 80 to 90% of those do so within the first three years of breast cancer treatment. So it's a pretty big deal, but unfortunately, lymphedema is not really talked about when it comes to breast cancer treatment when they're actually in the office with their oncologist and care team. So Lymphedema awareness is a part of breast cancer awareness. So I'm going to pass the baton over to Karen, who can maybe talk to us a little bit about how to talk to your oncologist or care team about the risks of developing breast cancer related lymphedema. What are the signs and symptoms and all that other kind of stuff that that we really need to know. All right. Well, first, I'd like to just say hello, everybody. Happy October. And October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And I treat a number of women who end up with lymphedema as a result of treatment for breast cancer. I'm here to tell you that it is normal to have swelling after surgery. And so a lot of women panic and think, oh my gosh, I have lymphedema, when it's really a post-surgical swelling that normally resolves over time. However, it's good to be aware and a number of women are proactive in terms of getting baseline measurements in terms of bioimpedance or circumferential tape measure measurements of their arms or chest and so on, just to kind of see, okay, where are we starting at? But if you haven't done that, never fear. I want to just toss out a few ideas here. So things that can cause swelling besides surgery can also include chemotherapy and radiation therapy. And in particular, there's one type of chemo drug, which is the taxane-based chemo family. Um, so taxol, taxotere, they are known to cause swelling, not only in the upper part of the body, but can also create swelling in the feet and legs. So that's something just to watch out for and be aware of and be proactive with. And uh, just a little aside here, a number of my breast cancer patients who end up getting a lymphopress pump for their upper quadrant, if they have swelling in their legs that persists long after the chemo, then sometimes we'll actually even get them leg sleeves to help manage that. And that's something that sometimes goes away with time. It's one of those things that can kind of come and go, um, lots of different factors involved. So things that women can do to prevent lymphedema 
would be to follow the surgeon's advice after surgery in terms of activity level, because some people jump the gun and they're almost too active. And that can cause irritation and swelling, especially um, reaching overhead too soon. So depending on the surgeon, you may be restricted for a few weeks. And I would follow those instructions to a T. There are lots of preventative things that you can do in terms of um, doing some massaging, some manual lymph drainage, even people with outlet edema, it can be very recreational and lovely and relaxing and a great thing after surgery. And it can help resolve some of the post-surgical swelling. So consulting with a lymphedema therapist after surgery, just even as a consult, is a way of getting education, getting some baselines, and something where you just kind of know the roadmap of things to look out for. So if swelling does persist for months after surgery, then that can be a problem and swelling can be anywhere. For a long time, Medicare acknowledged, and they still do, that lymphedema after breast cancer just occurs in the arm. And they did not acknowledge that women can have swelling in their breast or their axilla or their trunk or back. And those are all areas that can be affected by lymphedema that uh, Medicare and their wisdom um, don't necessarily, it, it's not always acknowledged and certainly not when it comes to um, certain reimbursements. So that's something I wanna just point out is that it's important to treat the whole body. It's important to treat everything. And some lymphedema therapists don't look further than the arm. And so it's very important to take it all seriously and to um, make sure that you're getting the right treatment. I'm gonna refer people back to the LEARN website because they are just so great at having a lot of um, resources, both in terms of finding a good therapist, as well as treatment and um, advocacy. And there's just so many materials there. So I'm gonna stop at this point um, because there, I could go on all night and talk about breast cancer related lymphedema and boy, don't get me started on fibrosis, but I want to give a chance for people to drop questions in the chat and um, more comments. And um, you know, I'm just curious if anyone else here has any thoughts or ideas on that. Karen, yeah, we have a few people in chat saying that, uh, for example, Sandra, my mother had breast cancer and lymphedema. There was not much help in 2003, and that was going on for her, and that's unfortunate. Yeah, and that's a lot of times still the case today. There's such a disconnect between oncologists or the surgeons and the education that's needed around breast cancer-related lymphedema, and it's also important to stress that it's not just breast cancer that can lead to lymphedema. It's any cancer treatments can essentially lead to lymphedema. Catherine, that's your experience. Um, if you want to talk a little bit about that or. Yeah, actually, I was just going to say when I was diagnosed, they never even ever mentioned the word lymphedema to my parents. Um, and I know many, many, many friends of mine who wound up um with cancer treatment similar to mine, they were never ever, I mean, they didn't wind up with it because the diagnose, like the treatment levels were different, but we were never told that that was a side effect of the treatment. I don't think in the early nineties, they really knew the severity of the damage that can be done. And unfortunately, um, radiation and cancer treatments are the gift that keeps on giving. And unfortunately for me, it has kept on giving in my lymphatic system. Would I like to trade my lymphatic system? Yeah, I would, but I wouldn't trade it for the world because I meet, I got to meet these lovely ladies um, many of times. And it's just been a world of a, I don't know life without lymphedema because I've had it since I'm eight. So it's definitely something that is a, I've had to grow accustomed to. But because I was pediatric when I was diagnosed with my uh, cancer, I was only eight years old. But, you know, um, as I learned 
the doctors learned with me. And many of them are still learning along the side of me. And they don't necessarily push me away in terms of making sure that they're understanding what I'm going through, which is huge. And you really need to keep that going for even, that doesn't matter what kind of lymphedema you have, but as a lymphatic patient, you have to definitely step up for yourself and speak when you feel that you need to be heard and make sure that you're heard. If you're not, you need to phrase it in a different way so that they understand what you're talking about. That's a really good point. Is there any sort of tips about like, what sort of things to ask your doctor or your care team if you are concerned about developing lymphedema with cancer treatment or especially if they if they are resistant or they don't really know much about it? Is there any resources or kind of a any script you can kind of follow um, when talking to them? Um, any keywords that will unlock something for them that they can understand that this is important? Karen? Well, I think that there are a lot of surgeons out there that feel very protective about hurting people. And as a result, I think that there's a lot of denial that lymphedema can happen. And I've even seen that from radiation oncologists. So my feeling is, is that if you have a provider that doesn't acknowledge lymphedema, and you feel like you need to be checked out, it's possible to go to any provider to get a referral. So I would encourage people that uh, are up against a brick wall. Uh, I don't know that there's a magic word to necessarily unlock the door. I would just get another opinion or go to someone that you trust and say, could you please refer me for a lymphedema consult? And, um, you know, sometimes even people that are resistant will be willing to refer to a consult, but not always. So that would be interesting. By the way, I just know that I dropped an excellent article in the chat. If you haven't noticed, my, my buddy Leslie Bell is a breast cancer lymphedema therapist extraordinaire. And she is amazing. So I want to just put in a plug for Leslie. Anything she writes is very valuable. We actually just had um, the research roundtable last night, which will be edited and put up on the Lympha Press USA YouTube channel soon um, with Leslie Bell and uh, Missy Baylor, who is a therapist and also has lymphedema herself too, I believe. And it was a panel discussion with Karen Ashforth and Dr. Karen Herps, um, all about breast cancer related lymphedema. So I'll make sure that's included in the email um, when this goes out too. So you can catch up on all of that great information. Um, and we've got a few people in chat chiming in. Wendy says she got melanoma or she had melanoma in 2003 and her lymphedema was not treated for years, which is so frustrating. And Ed Edwina was diagnosed with lymphedema after having multiple DVTs in the lower extremities and PEs which is also so awful. So sorry, Catherine, go ahead. So one thing, if a patient is just getting diagnosed with breast cancer, might be advisable to just bring up the question, what is the chance of me developing lymphedema based on what your plan for me is? You know, that might be, if you haven't had uh, treatment yet, that might be the kind of question just to pose to kind of get a feel does the doctor know what lymphedema is? Because you're going to know based on their facial expression. If they have no idea what you're talking about, it's going to be readable all over their face. Um, but um, then the doctor is going to realize that you as a patient are going to be one of those people who's going to advocate for yourself to get what you need um, and make sure that you're seeing the person, a person that has the knowledge that they need to know about you know, is what kind of damage can be done, is going to be done or potentially could happen to my body because of this cancer treatment that I'm going to receive. Yes, it's going to potentially save my life, but at the same time, what is the ramifications of that long-term? Because I didn't know long-term ramifications ever, never anticipated that I was going to need a hip replacement, never anticipated, you know, that my leg was going to be 65% larger than my other one. None of that ever came about because they never thought anything of it. And unfortunately, mine came about because I took a airplane ride. That's how I found it when it was on my make-a-wish trip 
to Disney World for my cancer, pediatric cancer, and on the way home, developed lymphedema. Wow. And that is actually a really good thing for people to be aware of are the risk factors. Because like Catherine, many people find that the change in altitude, whether it's an airplane trip, or I've even had patients go to the mountains and notice that they started to have some swelling. So what are the things that can precipitate lymphedema? Because there is a, the highest risk for breast cancer related lymphedema is in the first five years after surgery. But I think that it's known that there is a lifetime risk because many women have treatments that go on longer, hormone therapy, uh, and sometimes as a result of um, you know, changes in the body, there can be changes in body mass, which can increase the risk of lymphedema anywhere in the body. So that's something to be aware of. But having said that, I really, really want to say that my, my mission is to put lymphedema in remission whenever possible. And that's why I got so excited about fibrosis treatment, because if we can deal with the barricades that keep the lymph from flowing, then that can really help people. And I wanna just tell a story of one of my patients who had a lumpectomy 20 years ago. And when she came to me, she was really unhappy because the breast that had been operated on, and you know, this is a long time away from treatment, but it was, it was huge compared to her other breast and she had a lumpectomy. So that's not right. And that is a tip off, by the way, if you have a lumpectomy and you notice that that breast is the same size or larger than the other breast, that may be a, a, a red flag. But uh, she had a lot of scar tissue. And so we did some scar tissue treatment. And within about six or seven sessions, she went down two cup sizes and her pain went away completely. So I'm here to tell you that even if you've had this for a while, the surgeries that are coming out and the techniques that are coming out, don't lose hope because there are lots of treatments and lots of strategies that are coming out, um, new research all the time. And I, I see long-standing swelling change all the time as well, but it depends on the person, depends on the situation, the risk factors, and what people are willing to do and what I know how to do. So sometimes it's just finding the right treatment at the right time. So don't lose hope. Such an important message. Um, I want Real quick, before we go to you, Catherine, someone asked in uh, the Q&A box, anonymous attendee, how would treatment for cancer affect someone that already has an established lymphedema diagnosis? I think that's a really good question. Yeah, so someone who already has lymphedema, who is undergoing a cancer treatment, whether they had cancer as, you know, the lymphedema as a result of the prior, um, prior cancer, or whether this is a new cancer or something different, um, we need to take that really seriously and be as proactive as possible. So for anyone who has lymphedema, and develops a serious medical condition that might require surgery, of course, we're going to want to do a reduction as much as possible before that surgery, before the treatment, and try to build in a program to minimize the impact of the treatments on the already established lymphedema. So great question. Thanks, Karen. Catherine, your hand was up. Yeah, I just want to tap off what Karen was saying about sometimes, you know, therapists only have certain strategies that they use. However, if you work with your therapist, sometimes you guys can come up with something different that may work for you as an individual and don't necessarily automatically think, oh, that's not going to work or, oh, I've never had this done. Should we try this? I've done that many of times. And in the end, I've actually wound up with a therapist that goes, that was brilliant. 
I'm going to try that with somebody else. So like sometimes you have to kind of think outside the box because lymphedema is an outside the box condition where it's not the same for every single person. Therefore, we need to make sure that, you know, we're really looking at it as an individualized instruction, shall we call it, from a teacher's perspective. So we want to make sure that each patient is getting what they need for their body. Therefore, make sure that if your therapist is just doing your traditional, you know, things and it's not working, tell them so that they can try to figure out, look up other strategies, talk to other therapists, or even work with you to see what you think might work. Because sometimes the patient, what the patients think actually does count and it really does work sometimes, you know. Therapists sometimes don't necessarily always think that, but when it does, they sometimes are really, really shocked about it and they go, oh, I'm going to try this on somebody else. That's so true. I think lymphedema treatment and, and lipedema treatment too, a lot of times it is very DIY and a lot of lymphedema therapists and, and OTs and PTs, they're so used to kind of having to craft things and, and try new things and get really creative. Um, and we as patients do that too, whether it's making a makeshift elevation station to elevate our limbs or whatever it may be, we gotta kind of got to get crafty sometimes. And then that can help give ideas to other people who might not have thought of it that way. So that's so true. Um, we're getting a lot of questions in the chat and in the Q&A box. And I see, Catherine, that you tagged, you'd want to tackle the question in the Q&A box. Do you want to read it and, and yes. address it? Sure. So, and I only want to tackle this one because I know this one <laughs> really well. Um, all right. So it says, I have a large wound on my leg. I need a nurse. I need a nurse's help to change the bandages. Unfortunately, Medicare says I cannot have a nurse come to my home to change my bandages and go to the outpatient lymphedema clinic. Can we start to address these issues when we go to lymphedema treatment act meetings? So I am going to say that um, I personally have a large wound on my leg right now. So I understand what you're talking about. Um, I will say if you're not a Medicare patient, you have to check with your insurance company because a lot of the home care agencies will say, oh, all insurances follow what Medicare says. And that's not true. Because my insurance did not require me to be at home in order to receive home care, band, uh, wound, wound, wound uh, care at home. I'm actually able to work and still receive my home care at home. Um, but on that aspect, so a way around it that might work is if you can find an at-home lymphedema clinic. Like there are lymphedema therapists that are considered to be lymphedema therapists at home. At least in New Jersey, we have several of them because I know several of them. So if you can't get to a lymphedema clinic because it is considered to be out, out of your house, one of the things that was said to me by my insurance company was that, yes, it's out of your house, but it's like going to a doctor's office. So how is that different than going to a doctor's office? You're allowed to go to a doctor's office and get your home care, wound care. So lymphedema clinic should be the same. It's not like you're going to the mall. You're not going to the movies. You're not going out to dinner. You're going to an appointment. So you might want to try to fight that battle with the insurance, with Medicare a little bit because of the fact that you're really not doing anything that's out of the ordinary in terms of medical appointments. It's just a medical appointment that's three times a week. Um, and if you're in an area where there's not at home lymphedema therapists, you can also try explaining to Medicare that without getting the therapy that I need, the wound is not going to improve at a, as, at a, as rapid rate as if I was getting the therapy I need in conjunction with the wound care that you guys will be providing. So one of the things that you can do, and I think Medicare has it, I know most insurance companies do, is contact them and find out if there's a nurse case manager. Because if they have a nurse case manager, those nurse case managers are probably the glorious things in the world, in all honesty. They know what is allowed and what is not allowed. They know how to get it to work and they can refer you to the correct people to be able to get exactly what you need and how you need it and get the explanations across in terms of that lymphedema therapy is not, I'm going for a massage. I'm going for, you know, um, I'm going swimming. 
this is this is required. I'm getting a medical treatment done and medical treatments, as far as I know, are allowed along with uh, wound care. Thank you, Catherine. Very robust answer. Appreciate that. <laughs> well, um, I just lived it, so I don't, that's the only reason why I know. We've got another question that just popped up in the Q&A box that says, my mom has truncal lymphedema and was told by her local fitter that they didn't carry a single garment for women who choose to go flat. Instead of helping her find a different fitter or an online option, they suggested she just get prosthetics because then the garments would fit. Seriously, why are some of these fitters slash supply stores so bad? Also, is there a way for her to order garments online and still use her insurance coverage? Does anyone on the panel have advice for that or, or tips? Karen? There are places that you can order online. And um, I encourage if you can to work with a lymphedema therapist, because there are many garments that are made for women who don't have any breasts at all. And I have a number of patients who do not want prosthetics. They call them falsies and they, they just want to leave it be. So I would, I, I'm a little flabbergasted that um, a fitter would not give options and not give choices. So if you can find a good lymphedema therapist to work with, they can help you order uh, online through a national company. Uh, in terms of patients ordering online, what you could do is maybe reach out to learn because Veronica may have some resources um, in terms of that. Um, I do know that there are some companies where you can, uh, you can purchase compression and they will give you a super bill that you can submit to your insurance. But I would reach out to Veronica if you're having to do all this yourself and see whether there's a place that is a little bit more friendly towards patients. Thanks, yeah, and some people in the chat too, um... Someone said compression guru is a good place to look for compression garments online. Um, just friendly reminder too, a lot of you are sending really helpful things in chat, but they're only going to the panelists. So if you just change the setting so that it says to everyone, that way everyone can see it and uh, benefit from your, from your great advice. Catherine, go ahead. In terms of ordering um, compression garments, um, sometimes you can work with a um, national provider who has a website online um, and they will actually allow you to submit your measurements from your therapist um, as long as your therapist is a certified fitter um, for that particular garment because um, that's what I do. I don't actually go see a fitter at a specific location um, because unfortunately there isn't very many near me. So I actually have, my therapist is certified for Medi and Jopes and she measures me. I send the measurements up to the company they then take the, 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 the measurements along with, with the prescription and they get the authorization that they need. And then off they goes and gets through, through insurance. I never actually stepped foot in their office and everything is done that way. So it really depends on your insurance company, who's in network, who's not in network, because I do know like I've tried to get reimbursed from ordering something from like compression guru or lymphedemaproducts.com that I paid for out of pocket. And unfortunately, the insurance company did not reimburse me for it because of the fact that they were not in network. So you really want to try to use somebody who is in network in order to get reimbursed from your insurance company. Because as we all know, this condition is not necessarily the cheapest to live with. Therefore, we don't want to be just kind of throwing out money just for to, and not getting reimbursed for it. So you really want to work with that insurance company to get the list of providers who you can utilize and get those in-network benefits for at the best of your ability. So another aspect is that a lot of insurances are going to require specific documentation to justify the need for the garment. And that's another reason to have a good lymphedema therapist who knows the system and knows what to do. Because especially with the Lymphedema Treatment Act, everyone got, got all excited that, wow, Medicare covers garments. But 
I think that uh, the, the, the documentation requirements that are being put into place by the equipment companies are very stringent. So this is not something that you want to try to do necessarily on your own unless you've got the system figured out and you have a, a kindlier insurance than Medicare. That's a really good point. I know my um, insurance requires a, a lot of documentation and I'm not Medicare. So it's probably best, as Karen said, to make sure you have a professional who knows what they're doing with documentation because they may say, hey, you need to have four weeks of therapy documented and showing like in a recent time frame before we'll approve a new order for the year. Because I know my, my authorization is good for a year, but you know every insurance company is also going to be different just as every plan within every insurance company is going to be different. Angela, I saw you wanted okay. to say something. Yeah, I have Medicare and this is the first time, first year I've used it for um, garments. And I found that my doctor, I contacted my doctor, I went to a therapist and then I went to the fitter and the three of them talked together and shared measurements and notes. And I didn't have any problems getting um, Medicare to cover it. But I also have a secondary that stepped in for what Medicare would not cover. Thank you. Um, I'm switching gears real quick because we had gotten an email uh, last week from Chloe, and I see she's in the audience tonight. Hey, Chloe. Chloe asked, medical providers seem to have their own definitions of lymphedema. For example, I had two doctors look at my same lymphocentigraphy, and one of them said it's definitely positive for lymphedema because of delayed transit time, and the other said it's definitely negative for lymphedema because it showed no dermal backflow or obstruction. How can patients understand their condition if no one can agree on what counts as lymphedema? That's a really poignant statement. <laughs> it's difficult. And yeah. I, I don't think that there's currently any type of uh, definitive consensus on exactly what is the threshold for lymphedema in, in testing like that. Um, and for that matter, there's a lot of differing opinions when it comes to surgery and people that are trained in different ways. And we just don't have a uniformity of care in a lot of aspects of lymphedema. That's, that's just a very unfortunate fact. And what I would say that as a consumer, you go to whoever you need to go to to get answers that you need that ring true with yourself. We know ourselves best. And if something doesn't sound right, then like Karen said, keep, keep pressing for answers and information. Catherine. So many of you know that prior to me becoming a teacher, I was actually working towards a PhD in computational biology. My focus was actually on lymphatic measurement. And when I did my research, it was really, really, really interesting to find the different research articles from the different experienced um, lymphatic surgeons across the country and across the world. And there was no consensus, even in lymphatic circumferential measurements, what the definitive definition of lymphedema was. Some people said 5%, some people said 10%. Well, but then it also varied on, well, how are you measuring it? Are you including certain parts of your body, like certain parts? Like some people use water displacement. Some people are using circumferential measurements. Certain people were using certain distances in between. So they really couldn't come up with a definitive answer. But the one thing I was able to identify was if we were using uh, a tape measure and we were not including the hand, the fingers on our measurements to calculate our total volume, we were off by about 10 to 15% automatically, which meant how many people were we either underdiagnosing or overdiagnosing? There is no way to know, but in reality, we need to have a standard, standardized or mostly standardized way of defining if you're going to use circumferential measurements for lymphedema uh, diagnosis that you need to do it the same way. And you have to do it the same way, not only on one leg or one arm, but both arms and be consistent on exactly where you measure to get a correct percent difference. Because if you don't use the same landmarks and you don't use 
the exact same different spacing in between and you don't use the same tension, you're not gonna get numbers that work. So I do know like some big facilities um, use what's called a perometer, which will actually do the measurements for you. It's electronic, it uses these cool, um, I wanna say they're radio waves, but this thing goes you around your leg and it calculates the volume. It's one of the coolest things ever. Um, I actually use this as part of my research project and um, my calculations that I was coming up with met with the parameters measurements pretty accurately, but I was including the fingers and, the, and different pieces that were not necessarily always being included. And when you think about it, if you're gonna do water displacement, which is the true volume of something because you put water, put an object in water, whatever flows out of the, of the container is what um, is the uh, volume. But if you think about an arm, What's the first thing that goes in when you put your arm in? Oh, look, it's your hand and your fingers. So if you forget to take the volume, can't consider the volume of your of each finger and your whole hand, that throws off your entire calculation. So you really got to make sure that you're consistent. You can't use water displacement one way, one time. You can't use circumferential measurements another time. So you have to choose your measurement markings and exactly and be consistent exactly how they're doing it and make sure that whatever facility you're using, they do baselines to help you to understand. But there really is no definitive diagnosis of this is the percent difference. They're looking at various things. They're looking at measurements, they're looking at texture, they're looking at um, sensation, all different aspects. And all of those combined together is what really helps to define that, that lymphedema on a patient. But my definition of a, de a definition of lymphedema on my body might vary from a definition of lymphedema on Alexa's body or on Angela's body because we're all different in the way we're formed. And we're all different in the way our lymph nodes are scattered throughout our body. And they're all different in how they function. So it's kind of, I can understand why scientists and researchers have a really, really hard time understanding the difference, understanding, you know, is this lymphedema, is it not lymphedema? Because everybody's body is different. Even when you come to scans, everybody's body is gonna react differently to the scanning. So like, I know that when I had a scan done, um, we had quite the interesting results back in in February um, where my body did not, the lymphocentigraphy dye did not move at all. But when we did an MRL, the dye did move. Same, very similar dye. One was a, one was a, one was a, um, I went, Karen, is this lymphocentigraphy like a, like a PET scan, CT scan kind of thing versus the MRL is more MRI-ish? Yeah, they're, they're different ways of imaging. Yeah. So it really depends on the imaging type. So if they don't get a definitive answer on one imaging type, it doesn't mean that there's not another imaging style that could potentially be used to clarify you know, is there definitely a lymphedema or is there not lymphedema? So sometimes you might have to sketch outside that box again and really look to see what is going to work, what isn't going to work for you and getting that diagnosis. Thanks, Catherine. And we just had Nazarene Starner pop on, another certified lymphedema therapist who is super well-versed in breast cancer related lymphedema as well. So we are so glad she's with us tonight. We've been talking all about a whole bunch of stuff, but right now we were just discussing about how there's no like definitive diagnostic testing with lymphedema. There's different definitions of, of how people kind of define that or approach that or how they treat it. And it's just all over the place. As Brianna said in the chat, everyone is all over the place. So, um, Welcome. <laughs> Hi. Hey. Um, I were you guys talking about bioimpedance at all studies? No, but I no. was thinking about it when Catherine was talking specifically in relation to cancer-related lymphedema and surveillance programs using bioimpedance. So if you want to jump in on that, Nazarene. Yeah. So I, I do think that a lot of the cancer centers are using something called bioimpedance. And for those of bioimpedance spectroscopy, but for those of you who don't know what it is, is it measures the fluid levels in your body. And they're coming out with some uh, kind of standardized kind of information on it saying uh, what levels, um, and it depends on the machine, but if you go, they'll do testing before you have surgery for our breast cancer related patients. I do think they're moving into more than just um, breast cancer, but head and neck and gynecological as well. 
But what they're going to do is they're going to check you before you have surgery. They'll check what your fluid levels are. And if there is more than a certain variable amount that you go by, they are saying that um, certain levels, and I don't want to necessarily talk about one brand versus the other, but at certain numbers, they say that it's known to have lymphedema. And they're doing um, pilot studies and research on this. Well, actually, no, they've already, they already have a lot of research on this, that, you know, if you wear compression garments, when you're in that subclinical stage, when they're starting to notice swelling based on this bioimpedance, so they can check your fluid levels. And they're actually seeing that you're at risk at this point, you're in these subclinical stages, even though we can't visibly see any swelling and you're not feeling heavy or full yet, they know it's putting you more at risk for lymphedema, maybe because you've had lymph nodes removed, chemotherapy, radiation, all of these things that could be affecting the lymph, uh, the lymphatic system, then they are doing things like having you wear a sleeve. And, and there's all sorts of programs that are set up uh, throughout breast centers using this bioimpedance. So it's really kind of a new world that they're going into. And it's, um, you know, prospective surveillance rather than waiting until people are having the concern. So it's really cool, really awesome that they're trying to prevent a lot more of this from happening. That is really exciting, especially that they can de detect it at that subclinical level. And like you said, mm -hmm. you can kind of get ahead of the lymphedema, which is amazing stuff. But what can patients who had cancer treatment, specifically breast cancer, um, but in general too, um, broadly speaking, what sort of signs and symptoms should people look out for if they suspect that they might be developing lymphedema? What are those kinds of changes they should keep an eye out for? Usually people will notice heaviness, tightness, fullness um, to those areas or to anywhere kind of where that upper quadrant might be draining. So it I know a lot of times people are just looking in the arm, but oftentimes we'll have breast swelling. It could be in the armpit. It could be on the back. Um, all of these areas drain um, to where they take lymph nodes from or maybe have been radiated or had, you know, surgery effects. So, uh, you know, looking for any visible swelling, of course, too. Clothing may fit a little bit tighter or jewelry isn't quite going on. A lot of people look at their rings to see if they're having any issue with that. But um, yeah, those are kind of just the basic signs of, of the lymph, um, lymphedema that I think most of us look for. Um, usually, I think People say that within the first two years is when the majority of breast cancer related lymphedema happens because that's when they're doing the majority of the interventions for treatment. You know, they're going to be going through their reconstruction, their radiation, their chemotherapy in those first two years. So the majority of patients have it during that time frame. It doesn't mean that it's not possible to happen later on. But I think especially for those first two years, it's really important to kind of keep an eye out for any of those symptoms. Thanks, Nazreen. Um, we got a question from an anonymous attendee um, who is considering the SAPL procedure, which is the suction-assisted protein lipectomy. They said, the surgeon who I was referred to told me to expect skin numbness afterwards, which may not go away. This concerned me, and I'm wondering if anyone has any knowledge if this is true. Do we have any anyone on the panel with experience or insights into skin numbness after surgery? Catherine, go ahead. I've had <laughs> surgery before, and I did not wind up with skin numbness at all. So um, there was a little bit of, I had some pain, but I never had numbness. So I think it really depends on how they do it and how much they take out and their exact protocol that the doctors follow. Um, and every doctor has their own protocol, so it really depends on your doctor's methods, protocols, et cetera. Um, so that's really a question I would say you really want to talk to your doctor directly about and ask him you know, what is the percentage of patients that um, get this symptom because they should be able to give you a generic, a generalized uh, percentage if they have patients that have it. Um, I did not have it. And I know several other people who did not have it and they did not use the same doctor that I did. Thanks, Catherine. Nazreen, I saw your hand go up. Oh, there we go. There I was thinking, uh oh, how do I turn this on? <laughs> um, you know, I, I, uh, 
was able to work with a, a couple microsurgeons um, in Cleveland, and they told me that they noticed people who have more nerve uh, components after the surgery are the people who have more fibrotic, dense tissue because they're having to go in there a little bit more uh, deeply and aggressively to remove the tissue. And so they notice people who have, and I get, it's not going to always be the case, but that is who they told me that they're noticing are the ones who have a little bit more of complaint of sensation issues afterwards, whether it's hypersensitivity or the numbness. Yeah, Nazreen actually told me that we were at the National Lymphedema Network Conference in Kansas City over the weekend, and I'm gearing up for a surgery, a SAPL as well, um, in about a month. And I'm doing two weeks of CDT, complete decongestive therapy beforehand to help prepare and soften up to prevent any of those sensation issues afterwards and that pain. Um, and Nazarene told me that my leg felt softer since the last time she, cause she gave me an, a quick MLD session in my hotel room, perks of having friends that are lymphedema therapists. <laughs> um, and that, that was a relief to hear because I didn't even put that together, that that would be a component to, to pain or sensation issues afterwards, is that, that fibrotic, um, tissue. So, um, and Karen knows all about fibrosis. And we actually had a question earlier in the chat that I saw before it got scrolled away um, from Yolanda, who had asked, um, what is fibrotic treatment? And I know that that, that is Karen's wheelhouse. Go ahead, Karen. <laughs> well, so what is fibrosis? Fibrosis is when the tissues have become harder or thicker or both. And so, all of us understand scar tissue. Most of us have scars or know someone who has a scar. And usually they're pretty nice and flexible, but sometimes, especially if the surgery was um, deep um, or complicated uh, or over a large area, uh, the, the scar can sometimes not move very well. And that can act as a barricade to lymph flow. There's other things that can cause fibrosis. Anyone who has lymphedema automatically has the risk of lymphostatic fibrosis, which is a buildup of tissue that occurs as a result of the inflammatory effects of chronic swelling. Um, radiation causes a type of fibrosis. If you've ever had a cellulitis infection, the area where the cellulitis infection was, if you didn't have um, a lot of um, good decongestion in that area, sometimes a little plaque can build up there and cause um, fibrosis. Um, there's many, many other types, but um, fibrosis is treated in lots and lots of different ways. And some ways are very simple and some ways are very technical and it can be treated manually. So there can be hand massage. You can use modalities such as vibration or ultrasound or low level laser. There's different instruments that you can use um, that can create a positive or negative pressure. Um, there's a, electrical um, means um, that there, Right now, I'm really in love with a um, type of microcurrent and I'm playing with that quite a bit for scar tissue. So lots and lots of different treatments out there. And a lot of it just depends on what your practitioner is skilled in and what's the right modality to treat you. Because I wouldn't necessarily use certain techniques with every single patient, it really depends. And if you want more information, Google my name and fibrosis, and I'm sure you will come up with uh, a lot of information. I've, I've done some articles for Learn, I've done articles for Lymphopress, uh, I've even got some um, things posted on my website. Uh, so uh, that's just a little taste though, because I could go on all night about this and I won't. Thank you, Karen. I know if we're down to the last 10 minutes of the hour and Karen was going to lead us through a lovely little exercise. So we'd love to continue hearing your dulcet tones, Karen, if you wanna jump in on that and then we'll close out for the evening. 
Okay. Well, I feel like I've been talking a lot tonight. So thanks for bearing with me. We're going to switch gears for just a minute because when I think about breast cancer related lymphedema, when I think about any kind of lymphedema, it's a chronic, often progressive condition that can leave people in a place where life can be harder. There's more things that have to be done to care for the body and the mind and the spirit. Um, and what I want to do is to just give you a little vacation from that for a minute. So I want you to get comfortable and find a place where your body feels like it can relax, either where you're sitting right now, or you can lay on the floor for a minute, whatever feels right to you. And you can have your eyes open or closed, whatever, again, helps you feel more relaxed. And as you take a couple of breaths, just see if you can allow your body to sink into the chair, into the floor, into the bed, wherever you are. See if you can allow your body to sink another inch. And as you continue just breathing in and out, see if it's possible to imagine in your mind a place where you feel very calm and very safe. And this could be a physical place. It could be a fantasy place. But I want you just to imagine being surrounded by a place that just exudes safety. And maybe there are people in that place that go along with that feeling of safety. Maybe there are animals. Maybe there's other objects that you want to bring with you to that place that helps you feel calm. And just notice your body again and see how does it feel right now as you're focusing on these pleasant, calming, happy people, things, places. And maybe some of you are having difficulty or struggling getting to that place. And that's a sign that you may want to find someone who can help you get there. And as you continue breathing and just feeling this sense of calm and well being, I want to invite you to consider giving yourself this experience at least every day, even for a few moments. that this can be a way that you can take a vacation from lymphedema or from the stresses of the world or from anything, just even for a few moments can make a huge difference because you can create this space to be anything that you want. So if something doesn't feel quite right, just erase that and draw in what you do want. So 
So as you continue to breathe, just gently direct your attention back to this room, this Zoom meeting, this community, and just see if it's okay to bring with you some of the positive feelings that you've been experiencing in this place of calm. And continuing to breathe, just allowing your eyes to slowly open if you want them to. And in these last few minutes of our meeting, just see if you can stay in that place. Keep a foot there while you connect back with our community. Thank you, Karen, so much for that. You've even gotten my cat to come out and relax with us too now. He was so intrigued. Um, everybody, thank you so much for being with us tonight. This was a very topic-specific episode. I'm sorry, my cat is fighting me because he doesn't want the night to end. Um, and uh, we appreciate you being here with us all. This was really, really informative hour. I hope everyone takes care of themselves tonight and continues to, to practice that wonderful grounding meditations that Karen does. Fenton says, that was awesome. Thank you. Can I hire you for once a week with the meditation? Fenton, you're in luck. We've been clipping some of Karen's end of the session sessions and putting them on the lymphedema channel on YouTube. So you can listen to Karen's sessions anytime you'd like. Um, so with that, everybody, we are here every second Tuesday of every month at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you can't make it live, we still encourage you to sign up so you can get the replay email once that's edited and posted on YouTube. I will be coming to you live from Cleveland next month after uh, having some pre-op appointments for my surgery. So I'm excited to kind of fill you all in on that. And Nazreen may or may not be with me live uh, when we when we join you all. Hope everybody who's in the path of the hurricane is staying safe um, as well. Please know you're in our thoughts. And we hope everyone uh, continues to practice good lymphatic health. And we'll see you on November 12th, everybody. So thanks for being here and have a great evening. Bye. <laughs>